Detroit, 1969. Experts decreed that the Lions might improve if they could avoid the disastrous injuries of 1968. But injury after injury struck again. In 1969, the Detroit Lions were handed an overdose of the frustrating setbacks that are part of professional football. The 1969 version of the Lions ignored both the fates and the dismal decrees of the critics and nearly won a divisional title. In the season's opener at Pittsburgh, the wound-up Lions literally dropped the game to the Steelers and lost by three points. But they recovered and set a pattern for the rest of the season. A week later, they were a different team. The Lion defense completely shut out a New York Giant team that had just beaten the Vikings. And then the offense struck back from every possible angle. First, running backs Nick Eddy, number 40, Mel Farr, number 24, outran the Giants' defense. Then quarterback Bill Munson split open the Giants' secondary with an air strike to Charlie Sanders. And Nick Eddy made a fantastic grab for his first official touchdown as a pro. Arrow Man kicked in three more points. Then Lem Barney burned 74 yards with his first punt return touchdown, and Detroit had a shutout. But the pace slowed down again in Cleveland, and the Lions were put to another test. Quarterback Bill Nelson burned Lim Barney twice in 25 seconds with identical touchdowns to Gary Collins, and the Lions trailed far behind at the half. But now the Lions recovered in time to shut out the Browns in the second half and hold Leroy Kelly to a mere 16 yards. Behind a strong offensive line, Bill Munson coolly tossed a rocket to rookie John Wright, number 89. Then a Detroit dream came true. Mel Farr and Nick Eddy teamed up in the same backfield. The Lions rallied behind the backfield they had waited two years to see and earned one of their strongest victories. important. They displayed the courage they would need for the rest of the season and especially in the next three games. Against Green Bay, they lost the game and their number one quarterback with a broken hand. And when they met the frustrated Bears in game number five, they found themselves in the middle of a tornado. <laughs> Come on, turn around! When the defensive dust began to settle, two things were evident. 
The Lions had stopped Gale Sayers after 12 measly yards. But the Bears had stopped Mel Falk for the rest of the season. The Lions were stunned. History was repeating itself. But the misfortune united them and supercharged young Greg Landry. He threw into the Vultures' Chicago defense, where every inch was torture. When he couldn't throw, he became the game's leading rusher. Finally, Bobby Williams tore through the Bears for 86 yards. Then Landry hit substitute John Wright over the middle. Arrow Man finished off the Bears with a 46-yard shot, and Detroit had been tougher than Chicago. But in gloomy Minnesota, courage alone could not beat the Vikings. Greg Landry came up with a badly sprained ankle. Suddenly, injuries were erasing Lion stars again. At this point last year, the Detroit scoring attack collapsed and the season ended in despair. History was taunting the Lions. But one force remained rock steady. Very little marred the aggressive teamwork of Lion defense. They would be led to rank number two by their captain and inspirational leader, Mike Lucci. From his middle linebacker position, Lucci called all the defensive signals and then roamed all over the field to carry them out. Eleven-year veteran Wayne Walker, number 55, worked the right side and was more immovable than ever. On the left was one of the fastest pursuers in the league, young Paul Newmont, number 58. Four-time All-Pro Alex Karras was the leader of the front four once again. He has left his 255-pound mark on more rival quarterbacks than any other tackle. His sidekick was number 82, Jerry Rush, a very fast 265 pounds. From the left came Big Larry Hand, number 74, showing no signs of last year's injury. The right end was closed off by veteran Joe Robb, number 84, playing better than ever before. Frontline pressure, constantly forced fumbles or desperate passes into the battery of Lion backs. One was young safety Mike Weger. or acrobatic Tommy Ball. Even the Lions secondary tackles in the hard Detroit tradition. Veteran cornerback Dick LeBeau, number 44, is so savvy that he looks as though he is running the offensive patterns. He leads all active players with 47 steals and gets revenge if he can't have the ball. At the other corner is Lem Barney, who might be the most versatile athlete in the game today. He punted and he ran it back. But he played the role of spoiler the best. His tackles are portraits, and he's been an all-pro in each of his three years in the league. The powerful Lion defense led the league by forcing 23 fumbles and recovering 21 of them. That put the ball in the hands of the offense for a maximum scoring effort. 
so future Lion successes would rest on the powerful shoulders of number 76, Rocky Freitas. Number 68, young Frank Gallagher. 54, all-pro center Ed Flanagan. 63, guard Chuck Walton. 73, tackle Roger Shows. Veteran Bob Kolwakowski was out for the season, so this blend of experience and youth had to learn to work together in front of an ever-changing group of offensive backs. No longer was there the explosive speed of Mel Farr, and Nick Eddy was soon to be injured. So veteran Bill Triplett, number 38, would step in and become the team's leading rusher. Rookie Alty Taylor, number 42, would shake off an injury to bolster the attack with his slashing speed. Few people had ever heard of number 30, rookie Larry Watkins, until he proved he deserved the coach's attention. There would have to be clutch catches by young receivers like Johnny Wright. And speed from number 49, Larry Walton. Walton would show flashes of future stardom. The Lions would depend on all-pro tight end Charlie Sanders, who wanted the end zone so much, he was most impressive after he caught the ball. They would rely on the speed and grace of last year's Rookie of the Year, Earl McCullough. Double coverage tested Earl's toughness this year, but he fought and came up with a score time after time. Detroit would have to win behind two excellent quarterbacks. Bill Munson's crucial leadership would be gone for seven weeks, but young Greg Landry would emerge as strong and poised, even in the face of his own injury. He would win five games in Munson's absence. So the Lions would not concede to the gloom of last year's record. They would lose only one of the next eight games. On Thanksgiving Day in game number 11, the Vikings and cold weather squared off against Detroit. The Lions seemed to bounce off the Viking attack. Cold weather and tough competition would face the Lions for the rest of the year, but only the NFL champion Vikings would slow them down. For the rest of the schedule, the tough and courageous Lions would put it all together and win seven games. The Lions took off for San Francisco with victory packed into the luggage compartment. When they travel, the Detroit Lions fly on United Airlines. Of the 26 teams in professional football, 23 fly the friendly skies of United. The trip to San Francisco would be the beginning of the second season for the Lions. In game number seven at Kezar Stadium, Greg Landry wore high-top shoes to protect his injured ankle and led the Lions to victory number four. The Lions pulled out still another weapon for winning, the specialty team.
specialty teams accounted for over 200 yards of offense. And except for a clipping penalty, almost got a touchdown. Landry picked up where they left off and tossed to Charlie Sanders. The defense got still another fumble recovery to set up one of Errol Mann's four field goals. And Larry Watkins dove for six points. The specialty teams were emerging as one of the big guns in a very balanced Lions team. Under Lim Barney's punts were some of the hungriest and hardest hitting of the Lions. Dan Gorch, Phil Odell, John Wright, Dennis Moore, Bill Swain, Craig Cotton, Ed Mooney, Bobby Williams, Wayne Rasmussen, Bill Cottrell. It was appropriate that game number eight against the Atlanta Falcons was broken open with these men clearing the road for Bobby Williams, who sprinted 96 yards for a touchdown. The offense got red hot. Landry dropped a perfect bomb on Larry Walden, and he streaked away for the score. Earl McCullough got still another. Big Charlie Sanders wanted to join the act and came within two yards. But the Falcons rallied, and the Lion defense had to hold on to win. Alex Karras got a 22-yard interception. But the most important play was a Mike Lucci goal line tackle early in the game. The Lions took over and pointed the way to victory number six over St. Louis. Once again, the defense shot out every cardinal move. Then the offense humiliated St. Louis. Rookie Larry Walton took a handoff and threw perfectly to a lonely Earl McCullough. Then Landry hit Earl again, and that set up a strike to Charlie Sanders. Arrow Mann added two field goals, and the Lions got their second shutout, 20 to nothing. Next week, the cold weather in Green Bay had everyone jumping, and Greg Landry ran for victory number eight. Lim Barney managed to corral the dangerous Carol Dale. And Joe Robb forced another fumble. But the biggest thorn in the side of the Packers was Errol Mann, a Packer reject. Mann kicked three field goals that decided the game and left the Packers stunned. With Wayne Rasmussen holding, Errol Mann became the highest scorer on the Lion Club and was the deciding factor in half a dozen games. His acrid toe bombarded every team on the Lions' schedule. It was Mann's foot that saved the Lions in the very next game. 
Baltimore was the scene of the year's biggest controversy. A Baltimore punt sailed past the fair catch signal and touched Larry Walton. The Colts recovered in the end zone. But the ref ruled correctly, no Baltimore touchdown. And noisy Colt fans held up the game for 15 minutes. But when business had to be done, Bill Triplett ripped off a long touchdown. Then on a kickoff, Johnny Wright recovered a fumble and got another touchdown. Harold Mann kicked, and the Lions pulled out a tie. Game number 13 brought the Coastal Division champions to cold Tiger Stadium, and the Rams acted like it was a circus. But head coach Joe Schmidt was not impressed. Lucci struck the first blow. Then the Detroit defense dug in and held the flamboyant Rams to the embarrassing total of 96 offensive yards. Even when the Rams snuck into Lion territory, they were immediately ushered out. Los Angeles woke up. George Allen called on his famous defense. But facing them was their old teammate in good health, Bill Munson. Munson called a game that destroyed them. Alty Taylor skirted the outside. And Bill Triplett ran right through them. When he got them worried about Detroit runners, Munson tore open the Rams' secondary with powerful Charlie Sanders. On one of the most devastating plays of the year, he hit Bill Triplett for a 62-yard touchdown. man turned in four field goals. And speedy Earl McCullough lined up to put the icing on the cake. The Lions came away with their third shutout, more than any other team in the game. 28 to nothing. By this time, Lion momentum could not be stopped, and they won their last contest at the expense of the badly battered Chicago Bears. Chicago could do nothing right. Lions came very close to still another shutout and suddenly looked like they would have been champions with a longer schedule to prove it. The 1969 Lions ignored injuries and won nine games with unheralded talent and gutsy performance. Their building years were now paying extraordinary dividends. Joe Schmidt had managed to complete a puzzle even when there were pieces missing. In 1970, they will look forward to the addition of their number one draft choice, Heisman Trophy winner Steve Owens, one of the finest runners the college game has ever seen. And there is no question that the Lions are now championship caliber. 1970, 
and the Central Division title could be around the very same corner.